Lowercase, too. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't expect anyone. <laughs> Okay, here's special, uh, here, here's an extra credit for one of the raffle tickets, if they'll give one out. Uh, ASCII code Well, welcome. Um, my name's, uh, oops, wait, it's not, it should be showing the PowerPoint slide actually at this point, and it's not, so the media player has taken over, so I'm going to shut that down and see what it does. Do you guys got control of the sound levels, and we'll fake it when we get to that point? Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Ilanka Dunnan. Um, I am a professional game developer out of St. Louis, Missouri. I, ha I make multiplayer games on the internet at play.net. And I got involved with this whole crypto scene uh, by giving a talk on games at DragonCon. First of all, how many people here have heard me speak before? I'm just I heard you on BIMREP. Okay, on BIMREP. But how many have actually come to a talk? Okay, good. Um, so for you guys, you know, sometimes I hide puzzles in my presentations. In this case, I did not do that, just so you don't have to worry about looking for one of the secret things, because cryptos is like the big puzzle, and so I want everyone to be able to focus on cryptos. Um, so I was speaking about games at uh, DragonCon, and DragonCon is a big convention down in Atlanta, and they've got different tracks on different things, and uh, they've got the Star Wars track and the Star Trek track and the Buffy the Vampire Slayer track. And one of the tracks was on Electronic Frontiers. And that's where I was speaking about multiplayer games on the internet. And uh, hackers from SE2600 were coming in and they were speaking about computer security, hacking 101, hacking 201, how to keep uh, computers secure. So because we were all kind of speakers in the same track, that's how I kind of got to know 2600 and because we'd all be like having a beer at the end of the day. And through them, I heard about this code that had been released at the Freaknik 3 convention in 1999 in Nashville. And it was a code that had been released as a challenge to the attendees at the convention, but it had been a year and no one had cracked the code yet. So they were still handing out flyers as a way of promoting the next Freaknik convention. And I decided, I was uh, after DragonCon, I was stuck home one weekend with the flu or something and I was kind of bored and I started looking at the code and I just got really, really obsessed with it. And uh, I just, I couldn't put the thing down. I got completely antisocial, and, but I cracked it. And I won the prize, which was a free trip to the, the next Freaknik convention and free t-shirts and free drinks and, and other stuff and free hotel. And then I started cracking a bunch of other codes. And I went around a bunch of the hacker conventions, especially in the southeastern United States, and I, I cracked a bunch of other codes. I actually cracked so many that I was banned from competition. Um, for example, at the Atlanticon convention, when they released their code and it was on a sheet of paper, and at the bottom of the paper it said, note, past puzzle crackers are ineligible for prizes associated with solving the Atlanticon puzzle. Give someone else a chance, Ilanka. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, so I sort of had the, these crypto skills, and, um, and then um, September 11th happened, and I was wondering, you know, well, maybe I could help out with the war on terrorism or something, and so I called up my local FBI and asked them and said, hey, you know, can I help? And um, they said no, and I, I kept calling back and saying, can I help, can I help? And finally I got an agent who asked me what it was I know about, and I said, well, I know about, you know, you encoding, and I know about PGP and the steganography, and then he said, hey, you know, steganography. We've been hearing rumors that Al-Qaeda might have been using steganography as a way of sending hidden messages. And there's probably people out in, you know, in Washington, D.C., the big brains that know all about cryptography, but you know, we're here in St. Louis, we're in the local field office, and it's not really our mission. So um, could you come in and like, give us a little talk about what steganography is? And so I put, they thought I was, I think, going to put together this little 10-minute talk, and I put together the 70-slide PowerPoint presentation, and I went all over steganography. And, and what the, the state of the art was on it and what the rumors, the fact and fiction were about whether or not Al-Qaeda was using it. I don't believe Al-Qaeda was, at least not for planning the September 11th attacks. Um, and then through that talk, I, uh, I started getting invited to some other pl interesting places as well. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go on here. 
Um, so in this talk, what I'm going to go over is I'm going to go over Kryptos, which is the sculpture at the center of CIA headquarters. There are four codes on Kryptos. Three of the four have been solved. The fourth one has not been solved yet. It is one of the most famous unsolved codes in the world. Um, and I'll be going over what the first three parts say, how they were encrypted, and sort of the state of the art of knowledge about what is known about that fourth part. Um, I will also be going over a sister sculpture of Kryptos called the Cyrillic Projector, which had uh, the same artist who made Kryptos for the CIA also made a separate sculpture um, that had KGB codes on it, and I'll talk about that, and we cracked that one, and I'll talk about how we did it. Um, and um, I'm going to go over uh, definitely more about part four of Kryptos. And I'm also going to be talking about pop culture. I, some of you may have heard of this book called The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. And hidden in the artwork of the book jacket, there are five puzzles. And Dan Brown has said that these puzzles give clues about the subject of his next novel. Two of those puzzles refer to the crypto sculpture. And I'll be going into more detail about how those puzzles are put together and what we do or don't know about it. I could also probably do a whole talk just on the fact and fiction of the Da Vinci Code, so if anybody wants to talk to me about that later, I, I can definitely help. Brown has actually called me and asked me for advice about, you know, what, you know, tell me about cryptos, tell me what this means, tell me what that means. And I won't go into all the details of what we've talked about, but I can, I can tell you some of that. Um, and I also have this, I actually have my own book of codes, which Amazon finally started shipping the pre-orders yesterday, so I'm really excited about that, so I'm going to be talking a bit. Okay, um, so that's my title at Symmetronics, uh, play.net. Um, I've also been involved with computers forever. Uh, my father was involved with computers back in the days when they were the huge room-sized mainframes, the kind where if the computer crashed, they needed to reboot it by re-entering the operating system by hand in binary. By, by flipping the little switches. And he used to take me into work with him. And uh, I have memory, some of my earliest memories are being in those huge data centers. And I remember I really liked the key punch machines because when they were punching the holes through the cards, they'd be kicking out all the little chat. And so I'd always go straight for the drawers under the key punch machines and be playing with the confetti. Um, so I thought computers were fun because they always made neat confetti to play with. Um, and some of the other things, some of the other conventions I've spoken at, uh, DEF CON, um, I got invited to speak at the NSA Cryptologic History Symposium last year, uh, Hackers Conference, ShmooCon, a whole bunch of other places, and now at Nauticon. Okay. Uh, those are some of the codes that I've cracked. Um, another thing that, that some of you may have read in the news is uh, so after September 11th, I organized a crisis center for uh, my company because many of my customers in our multiplayer games were affected by the events of September 11th, and they wanted to know you know, how's so-and-so in New York? How's so-and-so in D.C.? Has anybody heard from them? And so I organized a big database. And um, so we just had hundreds of reports streaming into this email address. And one of the reports that came in was from one of my less scrupulous customers. It was actually from Cleveland. I'm just going to check. Is he here in the room by any chance? Okay, good. All right. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he used September 11th, September 11th as an opportunity to declare himself dead and then was going around online pretending to be his own widow and really traumatizing a lot of people. Um, and uh, there were a couple articles about that in The Plain Dealer and also in the Cleveland Free Times, and I have links to all that on my website if anybody... How many people here are from Cleveland? I'm just curious. Okay. Yeah, you, you guys can probably get that. I'd actually love to do some research in the newspaper archives here if anybody has access to that. Um, so um, I talked about the Cyrillic Projector. And then as part of my uh, Kryptos research, uh, people kept asking me, how famous is Kryptos? How famous is Kryptos? And uh, I decided to make a list of what were the world's most famous unsolved codes, because no one had done such a thing yet. And I made this little one web page on my site, and it just became hugely popular, just tens of thousands of people pouring in, and it keeps getting picked up by the blogosphere. I, it, it's been like dug, you know, the D-I-G-G -G like three times. Um, and uh, it's... It, people just love it. So a British book publisher contacted me uh, mid-2005, pretty much based on the attention around the famous Unsolved Codes page, and asked me if I'd be interested in putting together a book of, of codes, uh, simple codes, and also some information on the Unsolved Codes, and that's this book here. Are any of my contributors here in the room? Yeah, okay, Aesthetics is here. Any, I can't see through all the lights, but I just wanted to check. Okay. All right. This is the Freaknik 3 code that started all the fuss. Um, I won't go into detail, uh, but it was basically several different cryptographic systems, um, and it was sort of like peeling an onion, and then it ended up pointing to a website, and then there was some steganography in there as well. 
Uh, and then after I'd cracked it, I wrote this tutorial about how it was put together. And I wrote in a very cyberpunk, kind of a tongue-in-cheek style. So if you like that kind of writing, it's kind of a fun read. Uh, I keep having to fix the links on it because web rot keeps kicking in. And I say, go to this link, and that link isn't any good anymore. But I've, I, I've got a lot of things mirrored. A lot of things are pointing to archive.org. So it's still pretty much readable at this point. So through the Freaknik 3 code, there were some dead ends. And one of the dead ends, one of the red herrings was, OK, now go solve this. And so that was, there was a link to the CIA's website. And that's how I first heard about the crypto sculpture in 2000. And I didn't really do a lot of research on it at that point, other than reading a couple articles. But then after September 11th, um, I, was, I have a cousin who works in Washington, D.C. He sometimes works at the Pentagon. He had a very, very close call on the morning of September 11th. Some of the people he works with were killed. And uh, so in uh, fall of 2001, I went out to D.C. and I was visiting my cousin and I hugged him and, and we went out to the memorial at the Pentagon and then we were driving around and he said, well, you know, as long as you're here in Washington, D.C., there's a lot of other tourist attractions. Is there anything else you'd like to see? And I thought about it and I thought, well, um, you know, cryptos. Yeah, I'd really like to see cryptos. And he said, well, where is cryptos? And I'm like, I, it's at the center of CIA headquarters. And he said, okay, that's in Langley. And I'm like, yeah. And he says, okay, well, where in Langley? I'm like, I'll find out. But it, 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 it got a little hard at that point because it, there's no street address for the CIA headquarters. I mean, it's not like you can just go to MapQuest and say, give me directions to CIA. Um, and so it was, it was kind of difficult to find it. This was before Google Earth. This was before Windows Live and all those. And so um, what I ended up doing was actually something similar to what Google Earth does, which is I sort of knew what the building looked like because I'd seen like Tom Clancy movies with the overhead views of CIA headquarters. And I went and I downloaded a bunch of satellite reconnaissance pictures of the Langley, Virginia area. And then just went looking around until I found the right outline of the building. And then I knew where CIA headquarters was. And I gave the, uh, gave the directions to my cousin and we figured we'd drive by and we'd kind of like just drive by the service road and kind of scope things out. Um, but the thing is, is when you take the exit, and there is a sign saying next exit CIA, but when you take the exit, there's no service road. You, you take the exit and you're there, and there's this huge gate, and there's barbed wire across the top, and there's a guard shack, and all these big guys with guns that come pouring out of the guard shack asking very reasonable questions in 2001. Who are you, and why are you here? Uh, and we said, hey, we're just here to see cryptos. And they went, ah, oh, crypto, sorry, you can't get in. You know, entrance to the CIA is for people with official business only. And so I was saying, okay, can I talk my way into CIA headquarters? And so <laughs> I tried to think of all the stuff, you know, I'm saying, well, you know, can I, is there like a, a public tour day? And they said, nope, sorry, official business only. And I said, well, is there, um, can I get an invitation from my congressman? And they said, nope, sorry, official business only. And I, and I was ticking down everything on my list and they were very polite, but very firm and they, big guys, guns. And so we finally said, okay, I'm, we're not gonna get into CIA today. And, and we reluctantly turned away. And, um, but I kept thinking about, okay, official business, official business, and because uh, I wasn't going to give up on it. Now, parallel with all this, I had that other thing where I'd contacted the FBI, and the FBI had asked me to put together this talk on steganography, and I'm thinking, hmm, can I use that talk on steganography as a way of talking my way into CIA headquarters? So when I put together my talk on steganography, and I, steganography, by the way, is a, most of the people in this audience probably already know, but it's a way of hiding messages inside of pictures. And so I, as in my example of steganography, one of my examples, I used that picture, which is off the CI website, and I hid stuff inside of it in my PowerPoint presentations. And then every time I gave the talk, I'd show the slide and I would say, boy, I'd love to give this talk someday at CIA. And every time I gave the talk, boy, I'd really, I'd love to sit on that rock and just look at that sculpture for a while. I'd love to talk at CIA. Well, at one point I was invited to a DEF CON and I was giving the talk there. And, and how many people here have been to DEF CON? Just curious, probably a fair number. Okay, so I was in the big roof tent and uh, I'm giving my talk on Stegen and I'm saying, boy, I'd really love to give the talk at CIA. And at the end of the talk, you know, people come up, they're giving business cards and all sorts of, you know, oh, and, you know what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And one person that came up to the podium, they, they leaned really close and they said, I work at Langley. I think I can get you in. I'm like, cool, I don't want to be paid. I just want like two hours to sit on that rock and look at cryptos. And um, they said, okay, well, well, we'll talk to you later about it. They gave me a first name and a phone number. I didn't get a last name. And, um, and then we kind of got pulled away by the different convention stuff. So the first thought in my mind was, okay, is this really somebody that works at CIA or is this just somebody at DEF CON who's pulling my chain and saying that they work at CIA? 
And so after the convention, I called the phone number and I talked to them. They said, yeah, yeah, we're at CI. Uh, can you send us a copy of your slides? We'd love to have you come speak. And I'm like, well, you have to prove to me you work at CIA first. And they said, well, how am I supposed to prove that? And I said, well, send me an email from an official CIA email address. And they said, well, I don't have such an email. I said, well, get such an email. So they kind of went away. And about two weeks later, I get this email from the official address, which was .ucia.gov, so the unclassified CIA.gov email address. And I sent an email back to the address to make sure, so we had two-way communication, so it wasn't just a spoofed email address. But OK, so they really worked at CIA. And then we went back and forth on it because they wanted me to come speak and they kept asking me saying, what do you want to be paid? And I said, well, I don't want to be paid. I just want time to look at cryptos. And they said, well, okay, but what do you want to be paid? I don't want to be paid. And I said, make an offer. Whatever you offer, I'm going to say yes. I'm not going to negotiate at all as long as I get my time to look at cryptos. So we go back and forth on this. And finally, they contact me and they said, okay, you're going to come in to speak. You're going to speak on this day. You're going to get your time to look at cryptos and we're going to pay you $2,500. Okay, yes, fine. So, so that's kind of an example of negotiating with the government. I keep telling them, don't give me money, and they insist on giving me thousands of dollars. So anyway, all right, so Cryptos, a little more information on it. It was commissioned in 1988 because the CIA had um, their original headquarters building, and then they realized that they needed a new headquarters building. And they started that in 88, and they kind of put the word out to the general art uh, community and said, we need art to go with the new building. And uh, Sanborn was someone, James Sanborn was someone who had done other art projects around Washington, D.C., and he knew how to put forward the bid and all that, and he did it, and, and he went through this elaborate approval process and, and got the bid and installed the sculpture. Um, he had never before done a sculpture that had anything to do with cryptography. After, it was after he got the bid that he did a lot of reading about CIA, and then he decided he wanted to do something on the subject of codes. And he was teamed with a man who was a, a CIA analyst, who was also the, the head of the uh, CIA's cryptographic center, named Ed Scheidt. And Scheidt taught Sanborn about codes. And then those were the systems that ended up used on cryptos. All right. um, so I told you it was kind of difficult to get in, but I did get in. And I, they wouldn't let me take pictures of the sculpture, but they did let me take rubbings of it. And uh, my cousin's wife was an artist, and she loaned me some charcoal. And, and uh, so I'm standing there in the breeze with like four CIA handlers around me, and I'm <laughs> doing these rubbings of the sculpture. And uh, they made a real mess in my suitcase, I should mention. But when I got back to St. Louis, and I have all these really cool rubbings, I'm thinking, you know, somebody somewhere in the world might be really interested in these rubbings. I just have no idea who. There was maybe two or three websites about cryptos, really kind of, there was one or two people that like old, you know, lots of broken links. And so I decided to make one web page about cryptos to say, here's my rubbings, and here's what I saw about cryptos. And, uh, you know, if anyone's interested in it, and if anyone knows anything about part four, let me know. And I put in, here's links to the other cryptos information around the web, and here's the American Cryptogram Association, blah, blah, blah. And so I figured I was kind of like, okay, I'm done with it, and I went on to other projects. And then I started getting these weird emails that were coming in from around the world. And uh, one of these emails that came in and said, oh, I've solved cryptos, I know what part four says. And I'm like, cool, tell me what it says, and I'll put it on my website. And he says, well, if you take this letter, and that letter, and this letter, and this letter, it's my home address. It's proof that they're watching me. I'm like, okay. <laughs> And then about once a week, and, and it's continued. I mean, even this week, I'm continue about once a week, someone writes to me and says, I've solved cryptos. And, I, and I'm like, OK, you know, what's the answer going to be this time? And it's like, oh, it's proof that there's a relationship between Angkor Wat and Mars. I'm like, thanks very much. I mean, can, you, can you show me your, your, can you duplicate that method for me so we can have a third party confirm the solution? But um, mixed in with the emails, every so often I'd get an email from an honest to God researcher. And, and I had some interesting correspondence with them. With one of them, I actually came up with my own method for solving part three of the crypto sculpture, and I published that on another web page. And then he and I, uh, Gary Warzen, he actually just passed away last year. Um, uh, Gary and I founded a Yahoo group to kind of discuss more things about cryptos, and then more people started joining the Yahoo groups and joining and joining. Now we have like 800 people that are all really interested in this crypto thing. So this thing just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. So this, by the way, is part four. This is the, the bottom part that we don't know what it says. I'll, I'll go more into this later. Um, so um, there's four panels on cryptos. Two of them are a visionaire table. I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, and a keyword builds a cipher alphabet. The, uh, the first person to publicly solve it was in 1999. That was Jim Gologly. He was a California computer scientist, got a lot of media attention for it. 
after he'd solved it, um, the CIA came forward and said, oh, well, we have an analyst named David Stein who actually did it a year earlier, um, who solved the first three parts as well. A year after that, uh, in 2000, an article showed up in a newspaper called The Sun Journal by someone who covers the NSA and says, oh, well, the NSA says that they've got people who've solved it too. Originally, we'd heard the NSA had kind of rumbled about this a little bit um, when the whole Jim Galogly, David Stein thing came up and said, oh, yeah, well, we've got three people who solved it too, but we're not going to tell you who and we're not going to tell you when, which is a very NSA thing to do, the, the no such agency. Though here at the convention, NSA is not security agent or... I'd, I've seen some people walk around with the NSA badges. But in, in a, evidently in 2000, there was an article. And the way I got the article was when I was speaking at NSA last year, after I was speaking, they let me into the NSA Cryptologic History Museum. They actually opened it up after hours so I could come in and do research. And the librarian, while I was doing research, very quietly came up and put in front of me a copy of this Sun Journal article from 2000 that said, you know, following NSA people solved the first three parts of cryptos in 1992. So I'm like, OK, did they really solve it in 1992? Is this more misdirection? Is it a real article? Is it a fake article? I don't know. I've written to the reporter of that article, I think Tom Bowman from the Baltimore Sun. I have not heard back from him yet. So I'm just kind of presenting the information here. In any case, in the crypto community, there's a lot of argument about who gets credit for something. If somebody solved Cryptos Part 4 and then said, oh, I've solved it, and then they drop it in a drawer and don't tell anybody, Ten years later, when someone really solves it and publishes it, and then this guy with the com comes up and he pulls his answer out of the drawer, should he get credit for doing it first? And the answer, I mean, this has been extensively debated, the answer is no. In order to get credit for something, you not only have to do it, you have to tell the world that you've done it in a timely manner. You have to tell them you've done it, you need to tell them how you did it, and third parties need to independently verify your solution. So even though the NSA is kind of saying they had someone early, I, I really don't think that they should be getting a lot of credit for it, because it's not enough to do it. You've got to share the information. You've got to let the world know. Information has to be free. OK. So, but I will say that they're saying they did it. All right. Um, that's more information about uh, stuff from the article. Uh, supposedly, the CIA, uh, CIA's deputy director, Admiral Studeman, basically said to NSA, you guys are so hot. Let's see how hot you are. And uh, Vice Admiral John McConnell uh, took up the challenge. And uh, apparently, a four-person team ran computer attacks and solved uh, the first three parts by December 1992. But even the NSA said they could not solve part four. So to my knowledge, no one inside or outside of the intellig intelligence communities has solved K4 yet. All right, this is the artist, James Sanborn. He's still living in, uh, in the Washington, D.C. area, still doing a lot of art. Um, now, as I was getting all these emails from around the world, some of the emails were coming in, and they were asking various questions about, well, tell me this about cryptos, tell me this about Sanborn. And one of the questions they asked was, what else has Sanborn done? And so I went and I tracked down his agent, and I said, can you send me a list of everything Sanborn's ever done? And they said, well, there's no such list. I'm like, what do you mean there's no such list? And they said, well, there's no list. He's, he's done too much. It would be impossible to make a list of everything Sanborn has ever done. So I was like, OK, I'll make a list of everything Sanborn's ever done. So <laughs> I started writing to art galleries all over the world and having them send me the information. And stuff just kept coming in my apartment, just piles of stuff were, were accumulating. And through all this research, there were two things, really interesting things that popped up. One was when I got a big, thick folder from the Smithsonian about Sanborn. And I'm going through the folder, and it talks about correspondence here, and he displayed at this gallery. And then one sheet was all in Russian. It was a classified KGB memo that was stuck in this folder from the Smithsonian. And I, I go, and I talk to people who know Russian, and they say, yeah, it's left over from 1982. And, and it's about the Soviet dissident Sakharov. And I'm like, why the heck is this document in the folder? We didn't know, but I kind of like, OK. Well, and I told the FBI, hey, you know, I found this classified document. And they said, oh, yeah, it's probably left over from the Cold War. Don't worry about it. I'm like, OK. And <laughs> <laughs> fine, fine. Um, and another thing I found out was that after Sanborn had made the crypto sculpture for CIA, he'd made another piece, which he called the Untitled Cryptos piece, which he sold to a private collector. And I've tracked down the, the current location. It went through various hands. But the current location is in the home of a dot-com millionaire in Los Angeles. And when I was in Los Angeles for a gaming convention called E3, I called up this millionaire, well, his caretaker, and I went through all the, the handlers. Um, and I said, hi, I'm Milanka, the famous cryptos researcher. Uh, can I come in and take a look at your garden? And uh, he said, sure. And 
he let me in and I was able to take pictures of the Untitled Cryptos piece. And I found there were some differences on that piece from the version that was in the CIA, uh, C the center of the CIA. And I'll, I've got some slides on that here. So this is the Untitled Cryptos piece in the, in the home of this, uh, in the garden of this dot-com millionaire. You can see that it's shaped differently from Cryptos and it's got the two sides on it. And one side is all, it's the text of Cryptos repeated over and over. And the other side is encrypted Russian text. And this Russian text was repeated on another sculpture of Sanborn's. I should also say that um, this was the piece that was in the garden. And then Sanborn made another piece that was about 20% larger than this, which is currently at the Hirshhorn Museum. And it's called the Antipodes. So if you ever go to the Hirshhorn, which is that big round museum right near the Capitol building, right outside the entrance, you can see Antipodes. So the Russian text was repeated on another sculpture of Sanborn's called the Cyrillic Projector. And this is currently at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. And uh, this was the one that we put together a team and we cracked in 2003. And it came out to be extracts of two documents. Uh, one of them was instructions to secret service agents about how to develop a source. And the other one was an extract from a 1982 KGB memo, which was the same document that I had found in that folder from the Smithsonian. So it all kind of tied together here. And I will go into way more detail on that. Oh, and on the crypto side, there were a couple other differences. One was, on crypto, there were the four panels. And instead of um, two panels on the left and two panels on the right, on, on the untitled piece, the, two, the first two panels were up here. So you can see these diagonals. This was the visionaire table. And then here was the actual ciphertext. But it's in a different order. On the CIA version, um, the ciphertext, basically the codes are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4. And on the Untitled Cryptos piece, this is not the beginning of part one, this is the beginning of part three. So it goes three, and then it goes down, and it goes three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, and then it chops off halfway through part two. So we don't know why they're in a different order, but it's interesting that it, it delineates very clear, clearly where the beginning of part three is. Another difference is down around here, we have these two dots. Those two dots do not appear anywhere on the CIA version of the sculpture. They are only on the Untitled Cryptos piece and on the Hirshhorn piece, Antipodes. I've showed this slide to Sanborn. He says, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you ever talked to Sanborn about why he's so, uh, why he likes Cyrillic so much? What it is about the Russian alphabet that, that more often the question, that I'm repeating, uh, the question is, have I ever talked to Sanborn about what it is that he likes about the Russian alphabet, the, the Cyrillic alphabet? Um, and what he has said is that he, artistically, he wanted to show the balance between the Cold War, between the, Amer between the, the Western side, the Latin alphabet, and the Russian side. So there was the CIA and the, the uh, Russian side, and another version of the sculpture he made, and he actually called it Covert Balance. And he played, it was actually sitting on the mall um, in Washington, D.C. for a while. But he has made other sculptures that use other alphabets. He's got two pieces that are at the New Washington, D.C. Convention Center, which are two large, two large cylinders, like the Cyrillic projector, with different rings. So there's a pair of rings, and there's four stacks of rings, so there's eight different rings. And each ring uses a different language. So he's got Russian, he's got French, he's got Latin, he's got Abyssinian. He's got Chinese, and, and we're working on trying to transcribe all of these and translate all of these. The, the reason that we think he has um, actually Ethiopian, and I've tracked this down, I'm not certain, but I think the reason is that Sanborn every morning goes to the same coffee house in Georgetown, and the waitresses at the coffee house are Ethiopian. So my guess is that he got the waitresses to come up with a passage, and then he put that on the sculpture. But I haven't verified that yet. I want to... Yeah, the, the question is, is it possible that he re-encrypted each thing with a different language? And it's actually something we, we were worried about. Um, but Ed Scheidt has said that part four of Cryptos, though he and Sanborn did discuss that exact technique about the potential of making part four something in a really obscure dead language, they decided not to do it. And Scheidt has said, when we took him out for dinner in Washington, D.C., he, he has said, and we pushed sake on him, <laughs> all these other things. Um, he said that uh, part four will be English. Um, all the letters are used. Um, and I've asked him many, many times if he has reverse engineered it, meaning has he tested it to make sure that it's solvable. 
And he hasn't directly answered me on some of these. Like I've said, do you know what it says? And he won't, he won't answer. But I, I really went off on him at one point. And I said, well, how do you know it's right? Maybe the reason it hasn't been solved is because somebody screwed up. Maybe there's a mistake. And that's the reason it hasn't been solved. And he looked at me right across the table. And he said, I'm sure it's done right. So take that for what you will. <laughs> OK. So uh, two panels on cryptos are a visionary table. Um, and I won't go into the details of the polyalphabetic substitution system. Um, but basically, a cipher alphabet was made. So this has all 26 letters of the alphabet, but they're in a slightly different order. And the way this is done is that you take a keyword. In this case, we're taking the keyword cryptos. You take out all the letters. And then you pile up all the letters that aren't used on the right-hand side. So you still end up with a 26-letter alphabet, but it's just in a different order. So that's a quick way to scramble an alphabet, but all you have to remember is a single key instead of the entire 26 letters. I have a whole lot of puzzles like that in my book. Isn't it basically like a shift-key cipher, though? Caesar cipher is a little bit different, because a Caesar cipher generally won't use a, 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 a keyword. So in this case, we're using a two-keyword system, where you've got one word across the top and another one that's going to be in a along the, the left-hand column. So the keywords is cryptos for one and palimpsest for the second key. And it, so now, again, we have two keys, and this is a way to make a grid. And then that grid is what's being used to encrypt the first two parts of cryptos. So the first part of cryptos starts up here at the top plate. And you see where it says E-M-U-F-P-H-C. The first part is these top two lines on the sculpture. So again, we have the E-M-U-F-P-H-C. So we have that grid where we have cryptos and then palimpsest. And you take that E-M-U-F-P and you put E-M-U-F-P. So an E becomes a B, an M becomes an E, a U becomes a T, and so on. So E-M-U-F-P-H-Z becomes B-E-T-W-E-E-N, between. And you keep doing that over and over, and you can decrypt the entire message that way. So part one, that's the ciphertext for it using the keywords of cryptos and palimpsest, says, between subtle shading and the absence of light lies the nuance of illusion. Now it says occlusion there. There's a typo, a spelling there. But it's, that's the way it is on the sculpture. I've asked Sanborn about that. I said, was it just a mistake? I mean, it, it's hard to encrypt things. And he says, no, it's deliberate. But it's not what it is that's so important. It's where it is. It's its orientation or its positioning. Does that point to K4? Don't know, maybe. And a lot of times when I ask Sanborn things, and he so I say, well, what about this? Could this mean this? Could this mean that? And he says, it's possible. Anything's possible. <laughs> I even have him on NPR saying, it's possible. Anything's possible. I want to strangle him. OK, so, <laughs> so part two starts here on the third line, goes all the way down to the bottom of this plate. All right, this is the ciphertext for part two. You can see, again, we have all the different letters of the alphabet, and there's also a few question marks buried in there. The plain text, it uses the same method, a two-keyword polyalphabetic, a visionary system. But in this case, instead of cryptos and palimpsest, it was cryptos and abscissa. And the, keyword, and the plain text is, it was totally invisible. How's that possible? They used the Earth's magnetic field. X. The information was gathered and transmitted underground, another deliberate typo here, to an unknown location. X. Does Langley know about this? They should. It's buried out there somewhere. X. Who knows the exact location? Only WW. This was his last message. X. 38 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north. 77 degrees, 8 minutes, 44 seconds west. ID by rows. Or maybe ID by row S. We're not sure. We're guessing as to the punctuation here. So lots of questions here. We got the x's. We got the latitude and longitude. Underground, Sanborn said the same thing. That was another deliberate one, but it's not what it is. It's where it is. And then the latitude and longitude. Specifically in the latitude and longitude, I was curious about this thing, the 6.5 seconds north. Because anyone who's done geocaching here, you know that a tenth of a second of latitude is a very specific location, about 10 feet across. So where does this point? It points to the general location of CIA headquarters. Some people thought it pointed to Kryptos itself. It doesn't. It points to an area about 150 feet southeast of Kryptos, which is outside of the normal error that might be in, introduced into a GPS. And I, I'll have a slide that'll be coming up where I'll go into more detail on that. Now, some people have said that the, the answer to part one, between subtle shading and the absence of light lies the nuance of occlusion, might be a clue for the keyword abscissa. 
um, subtle shading, SS, absence, ABS, light, C, you know, maybe. Someone else has pointed out that abscissa has the letter CIA in it. This is all just speculation. We don't know. So I'm just kind of sharing the information. My hope is by sharing information about cryptos and shoveling as much information as I can at people who are smarter than I am, that it may help crack the thing. I want a big group effort with lots and lots of different viewpoints looking at it. So all this, so all the Dan Brown stuff I think is awesome because it's, it's making crypto sort of like a household name and that will make it more likely to be cracked. So part three starts here at the top of this plate, goes down to about here. I should also point out that there's these a few letters that are out of alignment. The Y-A-R raised up a bit, the D's nudged to the right a bit, the R is nudged to the left a bit. So we have this kind of group of five characters. When I showed this slide to Sanborn, he pointed at these letters and he said, has anyone figured anything out about these yet? They're important. <laughs> Don't know what that means either. Okay, so here's the ciphertext for part three. Um, if, this was, uh, if I knew this was a crypto audience, I'd probably spend some time saying, you know, look at it and what's the difference between this ciphertext and the ciphertext for part one and part two, but we're running a little short on time. The, uh, the main difference here is that it's a different distribution of letters. So not as many Q's and Z's. We're getting a lot more E's, T's, A's. This is actually English. It's the same frequency distribution as normal English language. So it's a different system. Instead of a polyalphabetic substitution system, this is a transposition system. All the letters of the message are there. We just need to figure out the right way to rearrange them. Now, the first people to figure it out, to my knowledge, figured out a mathematical system, which is that you count from the first letter E, and you count 192 characters somewhere down here, and I think you get to an S. And then if you go from there and you count another 192 characters, you get to, and I'm not sure exactly where it is, but you get to an L. You count another 192 characters, you get to an O, and you keep doing that and you start getting a message. Now, the method that I came up with in early 2003 was I figured out a possible pencil and paper way of doing this, which is that if you take all the letters of part three and you put them into this nice, even rectangle, now remember that first part that said ID by rows or ID by row S? Well, if you start here and you start with this S and then you count down four, one, two, three, four, you get to an L. Count down another four, you get to an O. Count down another four, you get to a W, L, Y. Well, first of all, you get these wonderful, nice, clean diagonals. So S, L, O, W, L, Y, slowly. And you keep doing that, and you can pull out the entire message in that method, slowly, desperately. So the plain text for part three is slowly, desperately slowly, the remains of passage debris that encumbered the lower part of the doorway was removed. With trembling hands, I made a tiny breach in the upper left-hand corner. And then, widening the hole a little, I inserted the candle and peered in. The hot air escaping from the chamber caused the flame to flicker, but presently details of the room within emerged from the mist. X. Can you see anything? Q. Who recognizes that? Anybody? Tut's tomb. tomb, exactly. This is a paraphrased extract from the diary of Howard Carter on November 26, 1922, on the day that he opened King Tut's tomb. The answer, by the way, to can you see anything is yes, wonderful things, or yes, it is wonderful. Uh, Sanborn has said he was fascinated by that passage. I should also mention that the original diaries of Howard Carter are kept in the archive at Oxford University in England, and Sanborn did attend Oxford University. We've been trying to get actual copies of those journal pages to see if you know, there's something scribbled on the margin or anything, but haven't had any luck yet. Okay, then we come to part four. I can't tell you what it says, because we don't know. No. Now, why hasn't it been solved yet? Well, um, first of all, it's short. It's only 97 or 98 characters. We, we're not sure 97 or 98 because of the leading question mark. We're not sure if the question mark is part of the end of part three or the beginning of part four. But generally, when cracking codes, um, cryptanalysis need lots of ciphertext to work from. When the Enigma messages were cracked in World War II, there were just hundreds and thousands of messages. Every day, they had huge quantities of ciphertext. And that would allow people to find the very subtle um, patterns that allow a code to be cracked. But with something really short, it's very difficult. Um, it's also possible that there's a key that's only accessible on CIA grounds. Cryptos was never intended as a public challenge. It was intended as a challenge to the employees at the CIA. Sanborn has said that the, uh, the theme of, this, of the sculpture was uh, in information gathering, intelligence gathering. So maybe there's something buried out there. Maybe there's something in an office somewhere. Maybe somebody needs to talk their way into the CIA history department. We don't know, but that may have something to do with it. Um, it's also possible that we miss something, um, or we may have been misdirected. Maybe when Sanborn is saying the two spelling errors are deliberate, 
um, maybe he's, he's just lying. Maybe they really are just plain old mistakes. And so he's just trying to send us off down a, a wild goose chase. Um, it's also possible that it is just broken, that it has a mistake. Some, I think some of the, the famous unsolved codes, I know some of the unsolved codes on my page are unsolved because somebody screwed up. For example, uh, someone wrote a book which had a cipher challenge in the back of the book. And the author later admitted, admitted with embarrassment that he had screwed up when he made the code and he couldn't even solve the code anymore. But uh, it's still out there because some people think, okay, well, if we can figure out what mistake he made, we may still be able to crack this code. So um, there was a question. Now, you said that that grid location, does that point to a door that would then have to do with that passage? So is it like point to a certain door in the courtyard that might have something to do with the... Okay, the question was where do, the, where, do the, where do things point to, and I will have a slide coming up. But I'm getting a little low on time, so I'm going to go through this really fast. On the Cyrillic projector, the way that we cracked it, um, it, was, it, well, it was created in the early 90s for gallery shows, and we started looking at it. Um, it was a three-step solution process. I first started working on it because Randall Bullock, who some of you may know through some of the, con some of the hacker cons, he took pictures of it, sent me the pictures, um, and I passed them along to the group. And um, I said, okay, well, let's make a transcript of the thing. And a couple weeks went by, and no one had made a transcript. And so I said, okay, I guess I got to transcribe the Cyrillic projector. And I spent just weeks, picture me in the middle of my living room carpet with pictures all around me of little pieces of a cylindrical sculpture with backwards Russian text. And I'm carefully transcribing each letter. But finally made a transcript, presented it to the group. At that point, two other members of the group popped up and said, oh yeah, we made transcripts too. Like, Great, thanks for telling me. But it was good then because now we had three entirely independent transcripts that we could compare to make sure that we had one really super accurate transcript. So we made this, we, we fiddled with it a little, and then we put it out on the web. And I was saying, well, maybe someone else out there will be able to use this and, and figure out the cryptographic portion. Well, sure enough, um, about a, 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 maybe a month after we posted the transcript, I got this email through my company's uh, anonymous feedback form saying, uh, send this to Ilanka. It's about the Cyrillic projector. And said, I have solved the cryptographic portion of the cipher. It is, as advertised, not terribly difficult. P.S. I'm doing this anonymously because I have a sense of humor. So I looked at this. Now, they didn't say what the plain text was. So I didn't know if this was someone who really had solved it or someone who was just one of the space alien crazies that was going to tell me that, oh, yeah, yeah, the Martians really did make Disneyland or, or whatever. Um, so and it was an anonymous feedback form, so I kind of filed it away. But um, and I, I already talked about this, about should an anonymous solver get, get credit? No. Um, but a couple months later, I was reading my weblogs to see who was linking to my Cyrillic projector page, and I saw this really interesting link in the weblog that ended with the, the, uh, the HTML, cpsolution.htm. I thought, wow, that's a really intriguing URL, so I traced it back. And what it was is it was by the same guy who had, made, who had sent early sent, earlier sent me the anonymous letter, and it was this one page. Um, and what he'd been trying to do was to give me another hint that he was the one that, that he had solved the Cyrillic projector. However, what he didn't know is that as soon as he put a link to my page, he didn't know that I was reading my weblogs and I could zoom back through the link and figure out who he was. And I, I have it blanked out here through the X's, but we knew exactly what his uh, Earthlink handle was, and then we found his email address very rapidly after that and wrote to him and said, hey, congratulations. Um, and um, at that point, he said that he had cracked the cryptographic portion, but he still didn't know what it said. And so then the race was on, and it was like Friday night, and I'm IRC and IMing, and everybody desperately trying to find um, you know, information to do it. And what I did is I, I made a spreadsheet. that it, I was, it was actually based off of something by an Italian named Fernando Stelle, who had a, a spreadsheet that was dealing with Russian. And then I modified it to, uh, to replicate this man's method. And I came up with my own kind of garbled cipher, or garbled plain text. And this is sort of... Um, uh, there's the decryption. Yeah, th this was my garble plain text. Does anyone here speak Russian, by the way? Read Russian that wants to admit it. Uh, if, if, <laughs> if you look at this, there's actually words there, but it's very, very difficult to read. And this is not what it says, but this is an example of the problem that we were dealing with. Um, and uh, this is, this sentence might be easily understandable to a native English speaker, but someone not familiar with English would have a great deal of trouble reading or translating it plus the fact that there isn't any punctuation, isn't any help either. 
So I was reaching out all over IRC, everybody trying to find a native Russian speaker that could help me tear this thing apart. And it, it took a while, and it was working cell phones, and it was chaos. But I finally tracked someone down. It was a friend of a friend of my father, who was a, an, an engineer from the ex-Soviet Union. And, and working between him and me and my dad and cell phones, we finally came up with the solution on the next day. And um, I was actually helping some friends move. So I was moving boxes and calling cell phone and going out in the front yard and getting a good signal and putting down boxes. And finally we had this and I put down my last box and I told my friends, sorry, got to go. I got to write press releases. And <laughs> I went home and wrote press releases and then all hell broke loose. And I, because Slashdot picked it up and man. So the, uh, the plain text, like I said, two parts, and I won't read this whole thing, but the first part was instructions to secret service agents about how to develop a source and how you want to weave a, a psychological net around the source so you can pull it tight at the appropriate time. And they say the reason you want to do this is because if you can control someone, then you know you can trust the information that you are getting from them. Uh, but I, I love the last line here. It says, um, uh, however, the methods and behavioral techniques that are needed to attain this goal are radically contrary to the ethics and morality of society in the field of interpersonal relations. I'm like, yeah, you think? <laughs> okay. And then the second part, and then this was the extract from the 1982 Pugwash memo, and this is the document that I found in that Smithsonian folder. And so the, uh, the text came from the subject line, which was, and again, I won't read to you, but basically it says Sakharov here, and anti soviet Skogo, and I, I can't print it, here we got American something. And uh, it was classified, secret, no, secret. Right. And the, um, the, when the press release went out, and Slashdot picked it up, and, and I really enjoyed the, uh, the chatter that was on Slashdot from. Well, first of all, the traffic was just insane. I mean, I've been carefully tracking everyone that comes to my website and saying, oh, I got five visitors today, and six, oh, I know who that person is, oh, I know who that person is. And then traffic picked up a little bit. And then I was, I was looking at, my, at a chart later that showed hour by hour traffic, saying, OK, this hour you got five people. This hour you got seven people. This hour you got 9,036 people. <laughs> Boom, you know, there's Slashdot. And it was just tens of thousands of people pouring in. And, and I really enjoyed the uh, chatter because then they started saying, no, 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 what the Cyrillic projector really says is, send more vodka. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, another one of the solutions that I just really enjoyed was, no, 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 what the Cyrillic projector really says is, keep information away from <laughs> moose and squirrel. <laughs> okay. right. so. So, so then we went back and we looked at the Cyrillic projector and we said, um, you know, okay, well, there were some spelling errors. Was this our screw up or was this something, again, that was hard coded in a sculpture? And it was hard coded. Our, our transcript was correct. So we don't know if these spelling errors may give us some clues towards cracking the CIA sculpture. So I'm getting back to cryptos. Um, so the latitude and longitude. So uh, here we have the original headquarters building and this is the new headquarters building. This building with the funny shaped roof in the middle is the cafeteria. And the crypto sculpture is right about here. So it's in the courtyard outside the cafeteria. So as the employees are eating lunch, they can, there's a whole wall of windows here so they can look out the windows. Sanborn made pieces here. He made pieces in the courtyard. And he also made several pieces out here in the front entrance area. Here's a close up. So again, here we have the cafeteria. Here we have the new headquarters building. This little squiggle here is cryptos. Sanborn designed this entire semicircular area. There's a duck pond here and some granite slabs. There's also some granite slabs here. We think that the latitude and longitude coordinates point to right about there. And we've, we've had people go there and look. We don't see anything unusual. These little dots are lunch tables, but they're, they're free moving. You can drag them around to different locations. There are a couple manhole covers in the courtyard, but there's manhole covers all over the place. What's underneath that spot, um, I've been told that it's not just utility tunnels, that there's actually a whole layer of offices underneath the CIA. So it's possible we need to go down someone's office and look at ceiling tiles. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, here's another image. This is from Windows Live. So again, we have cryptos here, and we have the duck pond and the slabs, and then Sanborn made these. Now notice how there's three slabs here. One, two, and three. And then we have the slabs here. Slab, slab, cryptos. And these two lines, the parallel nature of them, and Sanborn has said that that is deliberate, that the, the pieces in the front entrance were supposed to be parallel to what was in the courtyard. Now, when I've shown him a, th this slide and I've said, well, we think that this is where the latitude and longitude coordinates point to, he says, yeah, that's about right. It's either there or 
here. Now why he would say something like that, maybe the parallel nature of it, or maybe it's more misdirection, we don't know. Here's a, a close-up of that. So we have these large slabs here, here, and here. Now on this one, there's also an engraved compass rose, and there's a lodestone. And there's also sheets of copper in between the slabs that have Morse code messages on them. Here's a close-up of the slabs and these Morse code messages. And they say things like SOS, shadow forces, lucid memory, T is your position, uh, digital interpretatu. Don't know what that means. Now, Sam has said they're related to part two. Um, some of them have leading dots. I don't actually have a slide this, but the message, it kind of goes off the edge and then it's like dot, 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 dot. And one person in my group pointed out that this may be a crib towards figuring out a key, meaning if you take one of these messages, and I, I'm not remembering, I don't know if Aesthetics remembers, but if you take one of these and you drag it along the ciphertext for part two, and you decrypt, 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 at one point, if you take it off exactly five spaces, you get a little slice of plain text that becomes visible, and you can use that plain text to figure out the rest of the plain text. So you have to do it five spaces off. And the Morse code on that plate has five dots on it. So it might be a clue for what we do, what we are, we're calling crib dragging. So we're doing lots of crib dragging on all the different parts of ciphertext. Um, here's the uh, compass rose. There's the lodestone. Okay. So just checking how I'm doing on time. Way too much information. Not enough time. Um, so this was where we figured out the numeric key uh, for cryptos, and we found out that cryptos was a key for part three as well as for parts one and part two. Um, which is the, uh, the key is 1473625, which if you take the letters of cryptos, you alphabetize them, and you number them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then you spell it correctly again, you come up with the key 1473625, which is the key for part three. Deliberate or coincidence, we don't know. And this was the original mathematical formula for solving part three. Uh, there's also another method with double kilometer transposition. Um, I told you about how these letters are out of alignment. It's possible that those are a clue for a different kind of cryptographic system called rail fence, which is where you take a message like meet you at the clock and you, you write it diagonally, meet you at the clock. And then you take each line, M-Y-T-C-K would be the first part. And then that would, that would be a way of encrypting things. So maybe we need to figure out what the, what the angles are. Um, and then in, in this one, we took the first part, M-Y-T-C-K, M-Y-T-C-K first, but that's one, two, three. If you maybe want to start with a different number, so three, one, two, then you would start with the EUHO line, EUHO. And so there's all these different possible ways of doing it, and we're trying a lot of these different methods. Um, someone else pointed out that on the uh, Visionaire side, that there's this extra L at the end of one line. So there's two lines that both end with the letter L. And this line with the extra L is on the same altitude as the out-of-alignment letters from the other side of cryptos. So it's possible that that's a clue to draw the eye to that line. Um, we've counted the number of characters. I'm going to go through these really fast. Um, yeah, I told you that. Now, someone said in terms of visual clue, on the Cyrillic projector, if you're looking at the way that the light projects, you can see the word Medusa. And Medusa, or the Russian, ver of, uh, the Russian version of the word Medusa, is actually one of the keys for cracking the projector. Now, where is this word Medusa coming from? It's coming from the third line of this plate. And if you go up and look at the third line of that plate, there's actually an extra bolt that's right there. And it's, it's difficult to see from the outside of the sculpture, but if you look from the inside, it becomes really obvious. And it's the only bolt like that on the entire sculpture. Again, I've shown this slide to Sanborn, and he said, oh, oh, I, I stripped something out, and I just needed to add an extra bolt in that place. Possible, but maybe, it, maybe it's a clue, and he's doing misdirection. We don't know. Um, I won't go into that. Um, this is one of my pet theories, but I'll skip that. Um, part four, it's also been pointed out that we have the letters here, K, R, Y, P, T, and O, S. So we have all the letters of cryptos very close together. So maybe there is something about it needs to be wrapped around, or maybe that's a clue. Maybe we need to remove those letters from the ciphertext. Someone else pointed out that if you take all the letters of, of part four and you line them up in these seven-letter rows and you get this nice rectangle, that if you count the double-letter pairs, there's exactly six double-letter pairs. Five of them are exactly lined up, one under the, one under the other. The chances of there being six double-letter pairs, 
it's not statistically significant, it's like one in three. The chances that they'd be lined up like that is statistically significant. Chances are like one in a thousand. Also, the seven letters, you know, cryptos has seven letters, so there might be some sort, this might be a clue towards something. This is Ed Scheidt, the uh, uh, CIA, the head of the CIA Cryptographic Center. He said that he knew the last part of cryptos would be the hardest to crack. He figured it would stand for at least 10 years. And he said he did things to mask the English in part four. He said he used a little bit of steganography. Um, and when I've asked, I asked him at the art show, op a Sanborn art show opening at, a, at the Corcoran G Gallery in Washington, D.C. And I asked Ed, I said, why is it that you think part four hasn't been solved yet? And he said, well, you've solved the first three parts, but you did it without recovering the keys first. Don't know what that means. When David Stein, the CIA analyst, gave a talk at CIA about how he had solved the first three parts, at the end of the talk, Scheidt went up to Stein and said, congratulations, your answers were correct, but you did not solve them in the way that they were intended to be solved. So again, there may be some key that's on CIA grounds that we just haven't found. One theory is that you know, Sanborn hand-carved parts of cryptos. Maybe some of the letters are rough and some are smooth. Maybe if we could see it closer, we could see that the letters go rough, smooth, smooth, rough, rough, smooth. So maybe there's Morse, maybe there's binary or something. Maybe, we don't know. We just don't know. I mean, I'm considered one of the world's you know, top experts on cryptos. I've only seen the thing once. So we're, it's like we're looking down this long tunnel trying to see everything we can about the sculpture. So was stuff carved by hand. Someone has pointed out, with, uh, if you take the keywords abscissa and palimpsest and you anagram them, you can get the phrase PS. It's as simple as ABC. Is this coincidence? Is it, is it deliberate? We don't know. Right. Okay, also, when I was talking to Ed, he was very eager to see me get access to CIA again. He said, and I said, well, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get another speaking invite. And he said, well, if you can't get on, if you can't get on the grounds, let me know. So I, I told him, I said, I've, I tried to get another speaking invite. I couldn't get another speaking invite. And then I sent that email, and he didn't reply right away. But about two hours after I sent that email, I get this IM pop up on my screen. It's from Molly H. And it's one line. It says, the key to cryptos is comitet. Now, comitet, I recognize the word right away. It's a Russian word. It means committee. It's the K in KGB. It's seven letters long. Um, and I, I am back to this person. I said, tell me more. And they didn't answer. I am back a couple minutes later. They're gone. I reach out through my contacts. I say, who the hell is Molly H? I got people who go in and they check databases. And they say it's a, it's a screen name that was hacked and then deleted. It was hacked. They sent you a message. They deleted it. So... Um, so also Molly Hale, by the way, is the name of the person who's the head of the CIA's public affairs department, which I don't think means that Molly sent me this message, but if someone was going to give me a clue, maybe. And it's interesting that they said the key, not the keyword, but the key. And there's also seven letters in Comitet. So again, that letter I found in the Smithsonian folder. So was it a hint or a hoax? Whoever sent it, they knew I was working on cryptos, not hard. You go to Google, you type in my name, cryptos comes right up. Um, so, and they knew some Cold War history, and they're waving, and I have to wrap this up really quick. So I'm going to, these are other pieces that Sanborn has done. Um, this is a restaurant in D.C. that Sanborn decorated. It has classified documents. One of these documents is that same document from the Smithsonian folder. So if he put the source for the Cyrillic projector on that wall, chances are that he may also have the source for crypto somewhere on that wall as well. Da Vinci Code, I'll go through this really fast. On the back of the book, it says, if in that brown tear, it says, only WW knows. Also on the back of the book, really faint light red on dark red, we have the latitude and longitude coordinates, 37 degrees. But there, crypto says 38. The Da Vinci Code says 37. I've asked Brown why the difference. He says the discrepancy is intentional. This is something someone in my group made a 3D model of cryptos just so they could import it into a half-life engine, so they could take a crowbar to it and shatter it into a thousand pieces. <laughs> okay. And I had to see, I, I'm out of time, so I can't show the CNN interview. I will be out there later, and I'll be in the bar later. Anyone who's interested, I'll show you the CNN clip. So, summary, real quick. Cryptos has four sections of the code. Three of the four have been solved. Um, Sanborn's Untitled Cryptos piece has two sides. One side has the CIA text, the other has the, the KGB side, which is what we cracked. Both Sanborn and Scheidt have said it is solvable. 
Um, and my goal is not necessarily to be the person to solve it, but to help see it solved by sharing as much information as I can about cryptos. Um, anyone that wants to help, like help make a 3D model or something, we'd love to have your assistance. Um, and uh, you can get more email by, uh, or you can get more information by sending an email to our Yahoo groups, cryptos-subscribe, or email me, or in the book I've got information on cryptos as well. Do I have time for any questions? Sorry. Thank you all very much for coming. somebody would find another way, another back door, another way to, to find it out. So you guys could be chasing a ghost then. Because if you don't see then everything that you've done so far, well, it may be right. There may be some perimeter so far at the beginning. So we've been looking really hard for that perimeter. What if, uh, <laughs> what if you did something more of you like, don't